Well, let's try, um, let's try Mr. Moody. Howdy, Bob. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Moody, how do you feel about Coney Island opening? I only went to Coney Island once. It ruined my whole life. Well, how? Well, about 20 years ago, I sold my collection of speckled bird's eggs. I see. <laughs> and I took the money and went to Coney Island. You were going to have a good time, eh? I hid the world by the tail, and I wasn't letting go. <laughs> well, what happened? Well, as soon as I got off the train, a fellow sold me a red balloon. Yeah? Another fellow pinned a button on me that said, Chicken Inspector. <laughs> You were running wild, eh? I went into a place called the Fun House. Yeah? A gust of wind shot up my pants leg. Wind was strong, hey? Blew my union suit up under my arms. <laughs> what happened next? Gypsy. Gypsy told my fortune. Yeah? Gypsy said I'd be poor before I knew it. And you were? When I stepped out of that gypsy's tent, my long beaded pocketbook was gone. <laughs> Well, you had some day. Yeah, long about sundown, I went into a place that said Tunnel of Love. Tunnel of Love, huh? Yeah, I was sitting in a boat next to a girl. Yeah? It was pitch black in the tunnel. I couldn't see nothing. Uh-huh. All of a sudden, I heard kissing. You... <laughs> you heard kissing, eh? Yeah. The boat come out into the light. Yes? The girl's veil was up. Uh-huh. My mustache was wet. <laughs> What, uh, what did you do? Do what could I do? I married her. Oh. <laughs> Fine. She, she was the homeliest woman that ever wore gaiters. <laughs> really? On account of Coney Island, my whole life was ruined. And the moral is? If you're a single man at Coney Island... Yes? And you're going through the tunnel of love... Yes? For Pete's sake, carry a lantern. So long, <laughs> Saturday, May 27th, 1911. Memorial Day opening weekend. It's 1.30 in the morning and we're at Dreamland Park. Owners have poured thousands of dollars into renovations. The park has been repainted cream and firehouse red and is lit by over one million lights. Workers are finishing changes at Hellgate, a ride that takes visitors on a boat over rushing waters through dim, demonic caverns. In the haste to get everything ready for the open, something went wrong with the electricity and light bulbs began to explode. All at once, the lights flickered and the men were plunged into darkness. A nearby worker accidentally kicked over a bucket of hot tar, igniting Hellgate into flames. Most of the buildings at Dreamland Park were constructed using a combination of highly flammable wood, hemp, and plaster. Chaos ensued. Thirty minutes later, the entire park was engulfed in fire. Animals escaped, running in every direction. A lion named Black Prince rushed into the streets and had to be shot by police. More than 400 men fought the blaze. The new high-pressure water pumping station at West 12th Street and Neptune Avenue, built just for something like this, failed. By daybreak, Dreamland and much of the surrounding independent amusements were reduced to smoldering rubble. The loss was more than $5.2 million. Little was insured. Overnight, more than 2,500 people lost their jobs. Dreamland was never rebuilt. On a positive note, the babies in Dreamland's incubators, some with polio, were saved by the heroic efforts of Sergeant Frederick Klink of the NYPD, 
who made several trips into the burning structures to rescue the infants. Whispers in the dark Ooh, shadows in the night The Connie Boswell Show with Buddy Lester, Lloyd Schaefer and his orchestra, yours truly, Jack McCarthy, and here comes Connie herself. philosophy is very uh, simple, I think. Many people listening in do not know it or have forgotten it, but I had polio when I was three years old, and I was paralyzed from the top of my head right down to my toe. I couldn't move anything. They had to feed me through a tube. When I was four years old, Lee, let's face it, that was not exactly last Tuesday. We didn't have all these vaccines and iron lungs, and we didn't have the knowledge that they have today, and of course, they're still working on it, but they knew nothing about it when I was a child. So my mother just started in a kind of a logical way, and she started trying to make me crawl all over again to get the strength back. And within about six months after I had polio, the strength in my arms came back a little bit, and as I said, my family are musical. Mother wanted me to study cello, all classical music, and of course the practicing, you know, and I loved it. I adored it. I think practicing the cello helped bring a lot of strength back into my arms. I believe that that's a good philosophy in itself. People who, well, who even aren't handicapped or don't know that they're handicapped, because in my way of thinking, everyone is handicapped in some way or other. If a fine violinist has to get in a ring with a trained prize fighter, he is definitely handicapped one way or other. But the so-called handicapped people who have had accidents or blind people or can't hear, you just have to work twice as hard or sometimes ten times harder. I know, going by myself, I have had to work so much harder than the average person. When I'd play theaters, the Roxy in uh, New York City, they had big production numbers, and they didn't want you sitting low in a wheelchair, so we got an idea where I would sit on a tall cocktail stool and put the dress around, and I learned to kick my feet out so that when I'd come with two course boys bringing me out all dressed up that I looked like I was walking at the time. And my, my philosophy is that everyone has a certain amount of talent. God gives us all something, and we must seek to find out what that something is and just work as hard as we can to do the best we can with what we've got. And we must be able to face obstacles and try to climb over them. As someone said many, many years ago before all of us, obstacles are only stepping stones to success. <laughs> Never mind, Lloyd. Hello, Connie. <laughs> Gee, you're looking mighty sunburned tonight. Where'd you get the tan? Oh, I went down to Coney Island yesterday, Jack. How'd you get out there? By subway? No, no. I took one of those share the ride taxicabs. Share the ride taxicabs? Yeah, Jack. It was pretty crowded, too. In fact, it was so crowded, I asked the driver what the big idea was. What did he say? Well, he said he was releasing a bus for active service. But I really had a lot of fun down there at Coney Island. Oh, I'll bet you did, Connie. You know, I was in Coney Island just last year, and I had a lot of fun, too. That is, except for one thing. Mm -hmm. Connie, the freak show was a fake. Oh, how do you mean? Well, the man said he was going to show the only two-headed boy in existence. And you couldn't expect me to believe that. Why not? Well, how could he be the only two-headed boy in existence? My brother was still in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jack, stop your kidding. Now, you know you don't have a two-headed brother. Or do you? That's a story, and a pretty tall one at that. And say, that reminds me, I have a story, too. It's all about the fellow on a furlough. He's just a fellow. Connie Boswell was born on December 3rd, 1907, in Kansas City, Missouri. Although polio left her in a wheelchair, she sang with her sisters and in the 1930s had multiple hit records with Bing Crosby. Ella Fitzgerald once said that it was Connie Boswell whom she emulated. At the beginning of 1944, the newly independent Blue Network was in search of stars with name value. They gave Connie her own show. It debuted on January 12th. The series featured announcer Jack McCarthy, 
and comedian Buddy Lester with music by the Lloyd Schaefer Orchestra. Their summer solstice episode on June 21st was aptly called Coney Island. Jack, I'm really beat. Boy, that Coney Island really knocked me out. Connie, I bet you saw just about everything in Coney Island. Sure did, Jack. And guess who I saw on the beach with a girl? Who? Our funny thin man, Buddy Lester. Buddy Lester with a girl? That's right. Are you kidding? The only way Buddy Lester can get a girl to chase him is to steal her nylons. <laughs> now, don't laugh, Jack. They were really having a wonderful time on the beach. Making love? No, mud pies. <laughs> Did you hear that, Lloyd? <laughs> Buddy Lester spends his time making mud pies. What are you laughing at? They taste pretty good. <laughs> Look, fellas, when we get there, don't tell him that I was there, too, because I want to have a little fun. Okay, Connie, but here he comes now. Buddy Mud Pie Lester! <laughs> Hello, Connie. Hello, Jack. Brother, did I have a time at Coney Island? Hey, buddy, why didn't you tell me you were going to Coney Island? I would have gone along with you. Well, I didn't plan to go. I just happened to be standing in front of a subway station. A big crowd came along, and before I knew it, <laughs> Coney Island. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, is it crowded on that beach. Well, did you ever see Coney Island when it wasn't crowded, buddy? You're not kidding, Connie. I've been going there for seven years. <laughs> I still haven't seen the water. <laughs> <laughs> but did I have a time? I was about the handsomest guy on the beach. Hundreds. Hundreds, mind you, of girls were flocking around me. Hundreds of girls? Now, wait a minute, buddy. I was at Coney Island, and I didn't see you with any hundreds of girls. Who do you like better, Dick Tracy or the Summer Sisters? <laughs> okay, let's get back to the script. Hey, Connie, but how did you like that bathing suit I was wearing? Oh, swell. But don't you think the sleeves were a little long? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. But the stockings were a good fit. <laughs> But that's nothing. You should have seen what some of those girls were wearing. Well, what are the girls showing at the beach this year, bud? Almost everything. <laughs> you know, give some of those girls an inch, they got a bathing suit. <laughs> and the crazy things those girls do at the beach, why, one of them even went in the water. <laughs> I saw... Thank you. I... <laughs> you know, I saw a brunette walking around all day with a bottle of peroxide in her hand. A brunette with peroxide? Sure. She was trying to establish a bleach head. <laughs> Say, buddy, uh, was telling On the day the episode aired, Steeplechase Park was closed. Edward Tillyu, son of the late George C. Tillyu, passed away after a long illness on June 19th. Steeplechase remained closed for the following three days. Two months later, on August 12, 1944, a fire gutted nearly half of Luna Park. A dozen main attractions were destroyed. Unfortunately, building materials were strictly rationed because of World War II. Luna's owners charged a dime to view the ruins. The park would never fully reopen. Coney Island, the world's greatest fun frolic, with its beach miles long, all peppered with people. The place where merriment is king. In 1946, Luna Park's land was sold for $275,000. The new owners announced their intentions to build a housing project on the property. On October 5th, wreckers dismantling the park touched off a four-alarm fire. It burned for 10 hours. By the time it ended, only the park's administration building, ballroom, and pool remained. Simultaneously, as Americans began to flood the suburbs, New York City's Parks Commissioner Robert Moses saw an opening. He hated Coney Island with its cheap, amoral working class entertainment. Moses was hard at work getting the amusement land rezoned. He planned to wipe out any traces of Coney's past. During the day, the area was still a hotbed for beachgoers, sunbathers, and Nathan's hot dog eaters. But after dark, Coney, now filled with vacant land, transformed 
into a seedy underworld. 